course, is a pasuk. But the explanation for this is found in the Sefer Achinuch, Mitzvah Shin Vav, Mitzvah 306. And he explains that the purpose, the intrinsic purpose of Kal Yisrael is to keep the Torah. That was the reason why the world was made. That was the reason why Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim. And that is our purpose. Since we were taken out of Mitzrayim for the purpose of receiving the Torah, which took place 49 days later, therefore we count towards Kabbalah Satur. And he explains that counting shows anticipation. When someone is looking forward to something, you're looking forward to a wedding, you count down to the wedding. 30 days, 29 days. And so too, we count to show our anticipation for Shavuos, which, which um, represents Kabbalah Satur, commemorates Kabbalah Satur. Now, the, in fact, the Sefer HaChinuch asks a question. So why do we count up? Today is one day in Omer, two days in Omer. Why don't we say count down? And he says, imagine if you would start counting 49 days to Shavuos, it would seem so far away, you wouldn't feel the sense of anticipation. And therefore, we start counting up. One day, we already passed one day in Omer, three days in Omer, five days in Omer. And that builds the sense of anticipation. In fact, he says that halfway through, we should switch and start counting down. However, he says the nature of counting is that you always have to count in the same direction. And therefore, as such, the days of Svira are days where we have a mitzvah to show our anticipation of Kabbalah Satar. At the same time, there's a totally other aspect of Aymer. This is based with a Gemara in Sechtes Yavamis, of Samach Beis, Omid Beis, says that Rabbi Kiva had 12,000 pairs of Talmidim. There's 24,000. And they all died at one part of the year. What does your sin? Shaloi nohagu kavod zevazeh. They did not respect each other. They did not honor each other. And the world was empty from Torah. 24,000 Talmidim died. And there was no Torah left in the world until Rabbi Akiva started all over again with five new students, Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yitzhi, Rabbi Shimon, and Rabbi Lazar ben Shamua. And the Gemara says that all of them died between Pesach and Shavuos. And as such, we mourn the loss of so many Torah scholars in these, in these days. And at first glance, these two aspects of Svira, the mitzvah of counting, which shows anticipation, the Avelos on the Tamina of Rabbi Kiva have no connection one with another. They are totally coincidental that the students of Rabbi Kiva happened to die during the days of Aymer. However, upon deeper reflection, we'll see that it's not so. The Gemara says, the reason why the students of Rabbi Kiva passed on was because they were not noyeg kavod zevizeh. They didn't give sufficient respect to each other. Now, since when is that a sin punishable by death? Very important to be respectful towards each other. But at the same time, since when does a person who does not show respect punished by death? That's number one. Number two, why do we mourn the passing of the students of Rabbi Kiva? Mourning is only for family. Why do we mourn the, the, the passing of the students of Rabbi Kiva? They might say they were great Torah scholars. We don't mourn the death of other Torah scholars. We don't even mourn the death of Rabbi Kiva himself. Nor do we mourn the death of the other five Talmidim, the latter five students that he has. So why is it that we are mourning specifically the death of these 24,000 Talmidim? And Baron Cutler explains this whole episode as follows. A, a regular person who does not respect others is not punished by death. But these 24,000 students, they were part of the transmission of Torah. Torah 
Moshe Kibel Torah Misinai. Moshe accepted the Torah in Har Sinai, and he transmitted it to Yeshua and Yeshua to the Zakanim. And one of the transmitters of Torah to future generations was Rabbi Kiva. As such, Rabbi Akiva's students would be the transmitters of Torah to, fu to future generations. To be worthy of transmitting Torah, one has to have the 48 acquisitions that says in Perkei Ovis that Torah is acquired with. Let's go through some of them. Anova, humility. Diktu chaverim apulpul tamidim, students that learn together. Lev toiv, a good heart. Avas habrias, the love of the creations of Hashem. Distancing from honor. Um, feeling the pain of others. To be able to attain and acquire Torah in its entirety and its in perfect, perfection, a person must perfect himself in all these 48 acquisitions. Someone who doesn't is lacking in the perfection of the Torah. Because Baruch Hu said, I don't want an imperfect Torah to be transmitted to future generations. I don't want a Torah without Midas Tavis, without good character traits, to be transmitted to future generations. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu said, it's, 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 it's appropriate that all 24,000 Talmidim of Rabbi Kiva should pass on from this world. And the world will be empty from Torah, not because they committed such an egregious sin, but because the Torah that they would transmit to future generations would have been an, an imperfect and incomplete Torah. It would have been a Torah without um, Midas Tavis. Hashem said, I don't want such a Torah. That is why we mourn the students of Rabbi Kiva. It's not we're mourning their personal loss. As we said, we're not related to them. What we are mourning is this lesson. We are mourning to show the lesson that we understand that Torah without perfection in Midas Tavis is useless, or certainly can't be part of the transmitting of Torah. We don't even mourn Rabbi Kiva himself. When did Rabbi Kiva die? As we know, Rabbi Kiva was murdered by the Romans. We don't really know exactly when he died. There's, there's a common custom when we start Yom Kippur, they take out the Sifrei Torah from the ark, and you walk around the shul, and everyone says, and they say the words, the Pasuk, Or Zarua Tzadik Uli Yishrei Lev Simcha. What is the meaning of saying those words? And legend has it that Rabbi Kiva was killed at that time, or right before Yom Kippur. And the Romans said, you cannot eulogize him. The Kali Saul wanted to remember him. So they said the words, Or Zarua La Tzadik Ul Yishrei Lev Simcha. You take the last letter of that, every word in that Pasik, Or Zarua La Tzadik Ul Yishrei Lev Simcha, you'll get Rabbi Kiva. And that was Kal Yisrael's way of memorializing Rabbi Kiva. However, that's only, you know, you know, Michael, you know, as a side thing, but we don't mourn the death of Rabbi Kiva. We don't mourn the death of Rabbi Meir, Rabbi Yehuda. The reason why we mourn the deaths of these 24,000 Talmidim is to teach ourselves that a Torah which is incomplete, a Torah which is lacking in Midas Tavis, is a Torah that Hashem doesn't want. And therefore, now we understand how the two aspects of Svira come together. The, the real purpose of Svira, as the Sefer HaChinuch says, is counting towards Shavuos, showing anticipation for Kabbalah Satayra. The way we show anticipation, the way we prepare ourselves for Kabbalah Satayra is only by perfecting, working on Amidus Tavis. And as a reminder to that, we mourn the Talmidim of Rabbi Kiva. Let's think for a moment. What does it say about the students of Rabbi Kiva? <clears throat> Does it say that they cursed each other? No. Does it say that they besmirched each other? No. 
that say that they insulted each other, also not. All it says is they didn't show adequate respect and honor to each other. Nevertheless, if people want to transmit Torah and they're not capable of showing respect towards other people, Hashem says, this is the Torah I do not want and let the world be, rather the world be empty from Torah than have such an imperfect Torah. It's Kedai that we should keep Avelis till the end of time for this reminder. And as such, the two aspects of Svira, the anticipation and the preparation for Kabbalah Satayra, and the Avelis, the mourning on the passing of the students of Rabbi Kiva, are one and the same. That's how we prepare ourselves for Kabbalah Satayra by perfecting our character traits. Now we mentioned the Gemara and Yavamis says that the cause of the passing, the sin, so to speak, that caused the passing of the students of Rabbi Kiva is Shaloi Nahagu Kavid Zeloze. They didn't honor each other. When you look in the Medrash Rabbah, the Medrash Rabbah tells exactly the same story, but it ascribes it to a slightly different sin. <laughs> It says, They were envious of each other. They had tsarus ayin. Tsarus ayin is difficult to translate in English. There's a Yiddish word called farginning. They didn't fargin other people. I don't know how to translate it into a different language, because I know in modern Hebrew, they created a word, lefargen. To fargin someone is lefargen. So I know it doesn't have a good translation. But basically, it means to be happy for other people's success and not to be envious of their success. The Medra says the sin was that they had Soros Ayan. They were envious of each other. And we, as such, there seems to be a conflict. Is it because they were envious of each other or is it because they didn't respect each other? And the Panovich Rav explained that there's no conflict at all. The Medrash is discussing what was the root of the sin, and the Gemara is discussing what was the act of their sin. The act was they didn't respect each other. But there can be different reasons why you don't respect another person. You might not value the other person. You might not value the Torah that he stands for. So the Medrash says, no, no, that wasn't it. The Talmud and Rabbi Kiva had a lot of respect for Torah. They recognized the greatness of each other. The, the root cause of their lack of respect for each other was a nehem tsaru zebeze. They were envious of each other. They were not happy to, be, to celebrate the success of other people. That caused them to have a lack of respect. And therefore, what we see from this is that besides the general precept that success in Torah is based on Midas Tevis, specifically the Mida, the character trait that we have to perfect during the days of Svira are the character trait of having a Lev Tayv of having a good heart, of celebrating other people's success, having joy in other people's success, and not being envious of their success. And that is the key to greatness. I'll tell you two stories. There's a famous chasana in a wedding in Europe, Ramesha Soloveitchik, who is the son of Rav Chaim Brisker, was called Ramesha Soloveitchik, who eventually moved to America and was the first Rosh Hashiva in Yitzhak Al-Hanan, which was the precursor to YU. And he got married to the daughter of Rab Olya Prusiner. Famous wedding took place of Lithuanian Jewish nobility in Europe. And Rab Chaim Briska came to the town with all his his whole entourage, and they asked him, who should be Masada Kedushin? Every great 
Lithuanian rabbi was at this wedding. And they asked him, who should be Messiah the Kedushin? And Nechayim Briska said, Reb Lazer Gordon. Reb Lazer Gordon was the Rav of Tulls. He is buried in London in the Edmonton Cemetery, which happens to be a Federation cemetery. But that's besides the point. And he is, he is buried here in London. And he said he should be inside the Kedushin. And they asked him why, of all people, he was a rather young man, Reb Lazer Gordon, why should he be Masad the Kedushin? And Reb Chaim said, you know why? Because he is the God Ladar. He is the greatest person of this generation. And they asked Reb Chaim Biska, what makes you think or even assume that he is the greatest of this generation? He's a rather young man. And Reb Chaim Biska said, I want to tell you a story as follows. He opened, he was the Rav of Tells, which is in Northern Lithuania, close to Russia today. <laughs> he was the Rosh Yeshiva of the Yeshiva in Tells. And one day he wrote me a letter and said, Rav Chaim, could you please come and join my Yeshiva and be a lecturer there, be a Maggot Shear there? He didn't get an answer. So I didn't answer him. So I get a letter a week later and said, you probably don't want to be a lecturer under me in the yeshiva. I hereby am willing to step down from being the head of the yeshiva and hand over the whole yeshiva to you if you would come and teach Torah here. A time didn't answer either. And two weeks later, he gets another letter. He says, you probably don't want to be a Rosh Yeshiva in the yeshiva where I am the Rav of the town. So I will resign my position as Rav of the town, leave the town so that you should take over the yeshiva and teach Torah in our town. Chaim Briska said, a man who has such love of Torah that he's willing to give up all his own personal positions because he believes that Torah will be enhanced through that. He's not, he's not interested in whether he teaches or someone else teaches just that Hashem's Torah should be transmitted, this young man is going to be the God of Adar. He will be the greatest of the next generation. In other words, Rabbi Chaim ascribed the greatness to the lave tithe of Rabbi Leza Gordon, and, that, and he predicted that this will lead him to, to greatness. I'll tell you another story I read. Once again, one of the great Rosh Hashivas in Lithuania was called Rav Baruch Ber Leibowitz. He's buried in the Vilna Cemetery. They recently discovered his grave. He died in 1940, right before the war. And he had a daughter, which he had difficulty finding a shidduch for. I don't know why, but he had a very grave difficulty finding a shidduch for this daughter. And she was getting older and older. And she was very sad. She was very demoralized. Finally, someone made a suggestion of a suitable boy for her, and the shidduch went through. There was tremendous joy in the Libowitz household. And Rabbah Ber, although he was rather poor, he bought this future chassan, this future son-in-law, a hat, a tie, and a gold watch. And the chassan, as was customary at that time, went to learn in a different city. And everyone's making preparations for the wedding when the chassan will come back. One day, suddenly and shockingly, a package comes in the mail addressed to Rabbi Akbar. And in that package is a hat, a tie, and a gold watch. And it's the chassan writing, they decided he cannot, doesn't want to go through with the marriage. And he's returning all the gifts that he got. As you can imagine, Rabbi Akbar was very shocked. He was deeply pained. How is he going to explain to his daughter, who waited for a shidduch for such a long time, how is he going to be able to explain to her? How is he going to, going to you know, help her disappointment? But what should he do? He told his daughter. Every, the whole family was very, very upset. Some years passed, and she was still not married. And he gets a letter. Rabbi Akbar gets a letter one day. 
who is this letter from? The ex, the ex would want would be son-in-law, and he writes to Rabbi Ber, you know, I'm applying for a position, a rabbinic position in a certain town. Could you write me a letter of approbation, since you're my Rosh Hashiva, saying how how I'd be a suitable candidate to be the rabbi of this town? Tremendous level of chutzpah and audacity to go write to your ex-father-in-law for a letter of approbation. Avarach Ber is a very good-hearted person, and he wrote a letter. Not only he wrote a letter, he wrote a very effusive letter, and he was about to send it off. And then he said, one minute, let me call in three boys from the yeshiva. And he called in three boys from the yeshiva and said, could you read this letter? And they read the letter, and they said, why are you asking us to read this letter? He said, you should know deep down in my heart, I'm still very hurt by this boy, but I want to help him. But I'm worried maybe the letter that I wrote for him isn't effusive enough because I'm hurt by him. So I wanted three objective people to read the letter and certify that this is a truly effusive letter supporting this boy. Only after they said, well, you know, this is a beautiful letter, did he send it off. Why am I telling you this story? Not to tell you that Rav Ber, besides his greatness and his sharpness, was a sweet person also. But you should know that was the source of his greatness. The lev toiv, the good-heartedness that he had towards other people, that's what made him Rav Ber. That's why he was greater than all others. The Talmidim of Rav Akiva, because they were lacking this slave taif, because they were envious of each other, because they didn't fargin each other, that's why they didn't respect each other. And if you don't respect other people, then you cannot be a vessel that contains Torah. Now, Kodesh Baruch Hu says, I don't want such people, such people to transmit Torah. And therefore, specifically in these days of Sphira, that we prepare ourselves for Kabbalah Satera, we have to work on not being envious of other people, being happy for other people's success. How does one do it? It's against human nature to see someone else, someone you consider an equal, or maybe someone you consider even less than yourself, and be happy for that person's success. How does one do it? I saw in the Sefer that they asked Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman, the great Rosh Shiva from Nebrak, was Nifta recently, a few years ago. And he said, the main thing is never to look at someone else. Look at your own plate. Never look at someone else's plate. Don't look at someone else's life. Stay focused on yourself. They went and asked Rabbi Chaim Friedlander, the great Mashkiach and Panovich, and he said, no, it's impossible to avoid looking at other people, seeing what other people have. One has to strengthen one's own emunah, one's own faith and trust in Hashem, that everything someone else has is not being taken away from ourselves. Hashem has enough riches, enough honor, enough positions to give out to everybody. And if someone has something, it has not come at our expense. This is how you don't be envious, but there's something more than that, which is being positive, being happy for other people's success. And the way one does so is developing Avas Hashem. Rabbeinu Yoyner writes that a person can do mitzvahs and make sure not to transgress Averis, and nevertheless, he's still a hater of Hashem because it bothers him when other people keep Torah, other people keep mitzvahs. He wants to be the only one. Someone who has true Avas Hashem is happy when other people serve Hashem just as much as when he serves Hashem. In these days of Svira, we were supposed to prepare ourselves for Kabbalah Satera. And as we've outlined, the lesson of the Petira of the Talmud Rabbi Kiva is that we have to use these days 
to develop our positive character traits, have to be used to develop our lay of time, not to be envious of other people, not to look at other people, not to be envious of other people, and above all, be happy for other people's success. If we do so, then we can be proper vessels to accept the Torah. The last year, we've been living through very difficult times. The year of the pandemic, we're at the tail end of it, hopefully. And we have to use this as an opportunity also. It's been very difficult times because of the stress that there is in all of our lives. You know, there are two types of stress in life, acute and chronic. Sometimes you have an acute stress, a tragedy happens. Sometimes there's chronic stress. You have a constant thing aching at your heart. In the past year, we suffered through both of them. There was the acute stress, fear of illness, the illnesses, the losses, and then there was the chronic stress, a whole year of living in fear. And it's very, it was a very difficult year. And for some, it's still continuing, hopefully not so much longer. The first Aveda, the first challenge there is to us is to live a regular life as much as possible. Greatness is sometimes defined not by doing great acts. Greatness is defined by acting normal in difficult times. If you act normal in a difficult time and you don't let it pull you down, or even if you're down, you don't let it break yourself, that itself is greatness. I'll tell you a story. When I grew up in America, I learned in the Mir Yeshiva in Brooklyn. The yeshiva of the Mir Yeshiva was called Shmuel Birnbaum, famous Torah scholar, tremendous masmid. Used to walk when, and when I learned in the yeshiva, he walked into the yeshiva every day at 6 a.m. and learned straight for 20 hours till 2 a.m. But he used to apologize to his students that he's letting us down because he's not a role model, because he had had a heart attack a year before. Because in the good old days, he would come in at six in the morning and learn straight for 44 hours and only go home 2, 2 a.m. every second day. And he said, felt that's an appropriate role model of, of her smother of diligence. Now that he's only learning 20 hours in a row, he's letting us down. I'm just giving you some idea of his personal greatness. Now, he was getting older and he had plans to step down one day and his oldest son called Label would be his successor. Label was very similar to his father, tremendous diligence, tremendous drive and ambition. And unfortunately, suddenly Label became very ill. He was diagnosed with cancer. He was taken to the hospital. Everyone was praying in the yeshiva for his recovery. And one Matzah Shabbos, the call came to yeshiva that Label at age 44 with 10 children, eight children, I don't remember, just passed away. We went and told the yeshiva of Shmuel Rambam, you know, your son passed away. He said, let's, let's go to the hospital. He was driven to the hospital. And he comes into the hospital where he's going to de depart, say goodbye to his son, who was Nifter. And at that moment, a different student of the yeshiva is walking in the other direction. And Abshmol Rambam asks him, what are you doing here? And the student says, well, I just had a baby boy, my first child. And the yeshiva, went over to him, he hugged him, he kissed him, was wishing him mazel tov, asking him how the baby is, how's your wife feeling, whatever, and then wished the mazel tov and then continued to, to, you know, to say, bid farewell to his departed son. 
And we asked him, how did you do that? How did you overcome your own grief to wish someone else mazel tov and make him feel good? And the interesting thing is he didn't understand the question. He said, because I lost my son, there's no reason why this person shouldn't get the mazel tov and the congratulations that he deserves. As impressive as it is to learn 20 hours in a row or 44 hours in a row, that's even more impressive. To be normal at a difficult time, to act regular when you're going through difficulties. That is one of our avaidas. The other avaida is not for ourselves, but towards other people. People are feeling isolated, alienated, disoriented, and they need some attention. They need some encouragement, a bit of support. And it's a tremendous opportunity with a good word, with a smile, with sending over something to a person by picking up the phone and calling them, maybe sending them a package for Shabbos. You can do so much. In regular times, you give someone a challah. After all is said and done, challah is just a piece of bread, a carbohydrate with so many cal calories. But at a time when people are feeling alone, people are feeling isolated, and you show that you're thinking about someone else, you care about someone else, a challah is priceless. And you should know something else. If you reach out to people when they're going through difficult times, they'll never forget it. I'll tell you a story when I was at the beginning of my career in the rabbinate, had a man in the shul, a very successful businessman, very high powered businessman, probably the proverbial alpha male. I remember he drove a gold Lincoln Continental. And just to show like what he's like, he came into shul and said, one night I said, I have good news and bad news. So he said, tell us the good news first. He said, well, the airbags on the, on the, on the gold Lincoln Continental work. That's the good news. Bad news is it doesn't exist anymore, it was totaled. Very strong person. Now he, he was going to marry off his daughter was on a Monday. And Sunday, the day before the wedding, his wife died. She had pancreatic cancer and she died. And I remember going over to the house, I'm a young rabbi, don't really have what to say. And the first thing when I came into the house, he said, Rabbi, the chasna was supposed to be tomorrow. What's gonna be, what's gonna be? And I don't know what made me say it because I didn't think before I, I spoke. And I said, his name was Eli. I said, Eli, the chasna wasn't supposed to be tomorrow. You thought the chasna was supposed to be tomorrow. The chasna was supposed to be Sunday morning and it will be Sunday morning. We're gonna get up from Shiva and we're gonna go straight to the wedding. I don't know what made me say that. Didn't, like I said, I didn't think for a moment before I spoke, which happens all too often. You sh and it, more interestingly is, I don't know why I said that the chasna will be Sunday morning. Who makes a chasna on a Sunday morning? Should have said Sunday night or Sunday afternoon. Lo and behold, we're living in Muncie then. And when, when they, in the shiva, they, they called up the hall, when can we make a chasna? And they said, listen, when are you getting a shiva? They said, Sunday morning. They said, listen, Sunday night is booked and Sunday afternoon is booked. The hall has already have two bookings for that day. You want to make a wedding Sunday morning, um, we, can, we can arrange it. And sure enough, they got up from Shiva at 6.30 in the morning. At 10 in the morning, it's the only morning chuppah I've ever been to as Masad the Kedushan at their wedding. Now you should know this very high powered businessman for the rest of his life, whenever he met me, he would repeat the words. He said, remember you told me you thought the chasna was supposed to be met Monday, but it was supposed to be Sunday morning and it was? You remember that? And for the rest of life, he was a very staunch supporter of, of myself and all my endeavors. 
the strongest person, the wealthiest person, and he was a very strong, wealthy person. I remember him once telling me, Rabbi, you think I'm obnoxious because I'm rich? You should know, even when I was poor, I was obnoxious. You're talking about that type of person. And nevertheless, he remembered a good word that was said to a person at a time when they're vulnerable, they'll remember forever. And as such, it's an opportunity. At the same time, Be'ezus Hashem, as we know the death rates are plummeting, the hospitalization rates are plummeting. And slowly and slowly, we're, we're, we're digging out of the cave we've been in. And we also have to appreciate the good things that happened in this past year. Now, what could have possibly happened that was good? I think we lived in the real world a bit more than usual. Our schools were closed, synagogues were closed. But we, we davened at home, we prayed at home. We might not have been prayed with such a, a, a similar length or maybe less fervently, but it was real. The only reason we davened is because Hashem wants us to daven. We learned Torah because we wanted to. Parents were raising their children rather than schools. Those who made simchas, and they were allowed to, it was small intimate affairs with real simcha rather than shows for the public. And therefore, in a certain sense, the last year was living in the world of reality, not the world of make believe. And we must hold on to that reality. Furthermore, we all know that the way a person grows is by overcoming adversity. And therefore, the adversity that we endured in the last year will lead us to grow. However, at the same time, adversity sometimes affects us negatively. And this is what we call trauma. Trauma harms us and adversity makes us grow. But what is the difference between the two? What is the difference between trauma that harms us and adversity that makes us grow? Sounds like semantics, they're both the same word. And I read somewhere, something very deeply insightful. Trauma is adversity that was experienced alone. In fact, trauma and adversity are exactly the same. But when you share it with others, it turns into adversity. If you experience it alone, it is trauma. In fact, anyone knows in the psychological treatment of trauma, one of the things is to get the people, person to talk about it. And then you take it out, so, you, so to speak, take it out of the person, reframe it and put it back in a healthier box in the person's head. In the past year, everyone underwent trauma. And how do we switch that trauma to adversity? How do we turn it into something which is positive? And the answer is people should talk to each other about what they experience. I know it's sometimes it's hard to do so because you figure we all experience the same thing. There's nothing unique about what I experienced. And that is true. But everyone experiences something differently and personally. And therefore, at this stage, what we should be doing is talking to each other, individually, in groups, discuss what we went through and how we overcame it. As, as says in the Pasuk, the Oga believe ish yasichena. And the Gemara says, if you have a worry in your heart, there's something troubling you, talk it over with other people. If we can discuss our traumas with others, the trauma will turn from a harmful experience to adversity, which is a growth experience. At the same time, the people who not only suffered trauma, they suffered loss. People lost family members, friends, livelihoods. When a person loses something, 
and it's irreplaceable, one has to mourn. Only after mourning does comes consolation. And that's why the Torah has a whole prescription of what does one do when you lose a close relative. Three days of crying, seven days sitting shiva, 30 days a year. Then it's necessary to mourn because if you don't mourn, you can't heal. When, you, when one is in the middle of a crisis, one cannot mourn. One doesn't have time. One has to go full speed ahead. You don't have a chance to commemorate one's losses, to memorialize one's losses. And this is a necessary coping mechanism. Sometimes to cope with crisis and adversity, one has to harden oneself and just go through it. The Pasuk says, when the Geula will come, I'll take out the stone heart, your stone hearts, and I'll replace it with a heart of flesh. And seemingly it sounds like criticism of Kal Yisrael that they developed a stone heart, heart of stone. Once heard from Rabbi Simcha Wasserman, he said, it's not a criticism of Kal Yisrael, it's a coping mechanism. The only way Kalal Yisrael made it through such a long exile, long, bitter, oppressive exile, was by hardening their hearts and turning their hearts into stone to make yourself non-feeling. Sometimes you have to do that to cope. And then Hashem said, but one day there'll come a geula. And when that geula comes, I will replace that stone heart with a heart of flesh. You'll be able to feel because you won't be oppressed anymore. So too, when one goes through a crisis, especially a year plus long crisis, sometimes a coping mechanism is just to harden your hearts, to turn your hearts into stone and not to feel. And it's a coping mechanism and it might be necessary, but to heal, one needs to experience, one has to feel. And therefore, as one is coming out of one's isolation, one's shieldings, one has to actually feel the losses, mourn the losses, grieve the losses, commemorate the losses, and only after that will we merit consolation. Summarize what we said, uh, two aspects of the days of Sphira. The days of Sphira are the time where we, <coughs> we count to show our anticipation and our preparation for Kabbalah Satera. At the same time we mourn the deaths of the students of Rabbi Akiva, and this is not a separate coincidental aspect, but we mourn the, the passing of the students of Rabbi Akiva to show that we recognize that Torah without Midas Torahs, um, Torah alone, Ben Adam Lamachim, without Ben Adam Lachaveri, is, is, is not a Torah that Hashem wants. And therefore, we have to work in these days on increasing our positive character traits and above all, leiv toiv, to have a good heart, to rejoice at other people's successes. As we go through difficult times, greatness is trying to act as normal as we can and giving support and encouragement to others. Once we've finished with that, we have to allow ourselves to feel we have to discuss what happened to it and share with each other all our traumas because then we will, we will change it into adversity, which is a growth thing. We have to commemorate and mourn our losses, remove our stone hearts and replace them with flesh hearts. And if we'll do all of this, we will have done our true preparation for Shruis, which is the Yom Tov of Kabbalah Satera. And we will, in, in this plus and in this merit, we should merit the Geula Shalema. We should no longer have any, any hardships, any suffering, any oppression. oppression and we should all merit Rafuas Yeshuas and the Hamas. Good night. Amen. Thank you so much, Rabbi Zimmerman. Does anyone have any questions? Um, well, in the meantime, thank you so much, Rabbi Zimmerman. Really ex excellent, thoughtful, and moving consideration of Safira and preparing us for Kapala Satora.
and propelling us towards Shavuos with such a useful blueprint of how to prepare ourselves. So thank you so much. Okay. Next week, Rabbi Portnoy will be speaking on Ayn Hara, Evil Eyes, Red String, and Voodoos. If anyone wants to make a dedication for any of our shirim, please let me or Naomi Landy know. I want to thank you all for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next week, next Sunday evening at 8.30. And thank you so much again, Rabbi Zimmerman. My pleasure. Thank you, Rabbi Zimmerman. Thank you, Susan. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank you again.